Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. We remember the great ancestors of our faith, from Abraham to Sarah to Paul to Phoebe. Ancestors of the faith, we remember you. We remember the prophets and the priests, the ministers and teachers who have taught us the way of God. Teachers of the faith, we remember you. We remember our grandparents and parents, aunts and uncles, those who have gone before us in our lifetime. And we our faith, we remember you. We lift up the memories of children and grandchildren, brothers and sisters. Husbands and wives, parents whose lives ended too soon. We lift up to you, O oh God, the names of those we have lost this past year from our lives, knowing that they are with you forever. As we read these names, we will give pause after every name to remember, pray, and give thanks for their life. Bill Jones. Don Myers. Gib Schneider. Jerry Barber. Keith Hess, Nan Gaither, Paul Me. Rich Wiry, Wayne Wilkinson, today we also light a candle for all the saints who have been lost in this community and in years past that are on our hearts today. Thank you, God for the sacrifice made by those who have gone before us. May we walk wisely in their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love. We commit to continue their legacy so that the next generations find us worthy to be called saints in your kingdom. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who has richly provided us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay upon treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Michelle. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word and the powerful way that it speaks to and through us. We thank you that your Holy Spirit so inspired this word and faithfully carried it to us today and is here among us right now. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, that we might receive you and receive you well. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Last week I mentioned that seashells have the amazing ability to simulate the sound of the ocean when you listen to them. We know it's not the actual ocean that we're hearing, they're not like telephones to the sea, but the ocean forms and touches them, leaving its mark on their grooves inside and out, creating a record of it over time. And much like those old vinyl records, they replay the sound that marked them, amplifying it to the world around them. You and I are also made like seashells and vinyl records. As God creates and works through us, we bear witness to his power, wisdom, and love in ways that reverberate and echo all around us. While we may each only share a small part of who Jesus is, when we gather together as a church, our testimonies show a more complete picture of him to the world around us. God is the source of every good and perfect gift and the model of extravagant generosity. We can never outgive him. But we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus and grow to be more like him each day. And this starts with expressing gratitude. It begins when we share where we've seen Jesus working in us together. We gave you some heart cards last week and shared a couple questions in them. One was, what do you love about our church? And another was, where do you see Jesus in our church? Your thoughtful answers to those questions uncover wells of deep gratitude within your heart, bringing it to life in sync with the heartbeat of God. When you express and share this gratitude with others, it begins to change your view of the world, which in turn begins to change you. And then the air around you begins to change. And as you see and share Jesus working around you, others begin to see Jesus working in you. And that's how a person becomes a disciple of Jesus. We celebrate that work in the lives of those we've lost and how God worked through them to touch our lives. Now, there are many ways to express our gratitude for God's extravagant generosity. As we follow Him and express our gratitude, our sharing and good deeds result in caring ministries. We often connect the month of November with the themes of gratitude and stewardship. It's usually one or the other. We have a kind of self-perpetuating selling machine in our culture where we learn that those who are most successful in life know how and when to buy and sell. I've always imagined those very wealthy individuals in the world are like in some kind of high-stakes backroom poker game where lives are put on the line in the hopes that with the skill to read people or count cards, make a little bit of luck, anyone can prosper. Salespeople often get a reputation right alongside lawyers and politicians. We know we need them, and we want them on our side, not on the other side looking to take advantage of us. There's a fine line between salespeople and certain kinds of preachers. We get accustomed to hearing a particular kind of appeal every once in a while, hearing our heartstrings hugged, throwing some money at a problem in hopes that this is a good hand that will provide a solution. And the loudest, saddest story usually wins the most money. And we don't usually have time to check the facts before we write the checks. We rarely follow up on where the money goes afterward. It's just the way that things are. So when we hear the sales pitch starting, we automatically figure out how much we can afford to give to get it all over with. And in this whole process, gratitude and generosity and the stewardship of God's blessings are just lost in the noise. Because riches are more than money. Financial success does not always lead to happiness, nor does it earn honor in this life or the next. We share debts of riches that go far beyond money. And we must identify them if we want to be good stewards. We treasure the time spent with those who loved us well. We treasure the stories and wisdom passed down from former generations. And when the waters get rough and the times get tough, we remember the prayers and the support of the saints that went before us. We remember how they prayed for us as we faced smaller challenges while they dealt with bigger ones themselves. And those prayers and their shared faith are precious riches inherited from our spiritual fathers and mothers. The saying that sometimes you don't know what you have until you lose it is true. But maybe we can take a tip from the book of Job and recognize that sometimes the way to be a good steward of those blessings is to be willing to let them go. 
As Paul wrote to Timothy, we should not place our hope in our wealth, whether that's money, possessions, property, or even our relationships. The only place fit for our hope is in Jesus. Therefore, the first step in being good stewards of God's blessings involves taking inventory of our riches. And sometimes that means cleaning up, clearing out, and letting go of things to discover what other riches lie beneath the surface. And today's scripture passage is a short ending to a personal letter between Paul and his disciple Timothy. In this letter, we gain powerful insights from one of the most important and powerful communicators of the first century and his protege. We also get the inside scoop on what the early church thought, felt, and dealt with as they worked to teach people from very different backgrounds how to be a family together in the grace and power of Jesus. And it's easy to dilute those three small verses into this idea that we'll be happy if we do good deeds. Nearly every community organization, political party, religion, and self-help book conveys that message. But if you look at the words that Paul uses here, it's not an idea, it's a command. And Paul justifies that command by telling us to remember where our provision came from. We didn't get here by hard work and a little luck. We got here because God provided for us every step of the way. We share because God tells us to, not because it will make us happier or more popular. We share all our wealth, not just our money. We give our time, our energy, our strength, and our talents. We provide our expertise and our creative insights. We give by serving one another praying for one another, celebrating and mourning together. And while we may not do all of these things at the same time, God calls us all to do each of these at some point. As Jesus, our Good Shepherd, gathers us as his disciples, we share what we receive from him through our words and our deeds. And this is how ministries are formed. When they flow from gratitude for what God is doing in us, they result then in ministries that genuinely show God's love and help others connect to him. And we focus a lot on being Jesus' hands and feet as the body of Christ. But hands and feet don't work well or last very long if the heart is not doing its job. This vital organ has a single task, giving and receiving. It takes the small amount it needs and it passes on everything else to help the rest of the body grow and thrive. A generous heart, a grateful heart, the heart of a good steward beats in the rhythm of praise for all that God has done and is doing. It plunges ahead, knowing that God will provide for tomorrow. It receives and gives. And when the body needs more, it receives more and it gives more. And it does its work seemingly without thought, because it's so focused on its one job, that beating in rhythm and nourishing the body become more than an activity. It becomes the very character of the heart. And Jesus showed us what living and loving what God's heart means. And he did many things, but there at the center of it all was a man who received everything God gave him with gratitude and then share it generously with everyone he touched. He is our model of that true life that Paul wrote to Timothy about. When we receive from God with gratitude and share all we receive from him generously, we are transformed into people after God's own heart. And our ministries become caring ministries that connect others with the love of God in a way that we could never provide on our own. Brothers and sisters, where do you see Jesus in your life? Where do you see Jesus in our church? Who do you see Jesus demonstrating that part of God through to you? And will you share that as a grateful and generous steward of God's blessings? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for every gift that you give us. We know you are the model of generosity. 
and we thank you for inviting us to become like you. We feel our weaknesses and our worries, but you have given us your son Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins and as the model of what it looks like to live the life you call us to live. Help us see the gifts that you've given us. Help us to let go of the things that we need to release. Give us the faith and courage to trust you daily as the one who provides. Lead us to love like you. In Jesus' name, amen.